Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. I don't get uh, to hear the singing from up front very often. That sounds really good. All right. You have to excuse me. I've never used PowerPoint for a sermon before. So, and if it wasn't for uh, Judy and Peggy in the office, I wouldn't be using it today either. So, uh, we'll see how this goes. All right. Should Christians celebrate Christmas? I have a lot of information that I'm going to, that I sifted through, and I'm going to try and compact this into a half an hour. So. Put your seatbelts on because it's going to be moving pretty quick. All right, let's start out with in the, the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, verses 9 through 13. So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the time of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord, your God, in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men, women, and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to feel the, fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, and that your children who have, not, who have not known it, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as they live in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. Moses is addressing the people before they, they cross into Canaan land and uh, talks about reading the law. We don't read in scripture too many times where the law was actually read to everyone, but one example of that is in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, where uh, Nehemiah... Uh, Israel, because of their sin, has been taken into captivity, being punished by God. Nehemiah goes to King Artaxerxes and requests permission to go to uh, the land of his fathers uh, for a ceremony. And that permission is granted. And Ezra, in verse 6, is blessed by the Lord. And I'm going to skip down to verse 7 here. And uh, I'm not going to try and read all those names there. Uh, but it says the Levites helped the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. So the Levites, the priests moved throughout the multitude of Israel. You had the whole nation of Israel there and the, with Levi reading the law and then the priest moving throughout the, uh, the multitude. They helped the people understand the law and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book of the law of God and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. That was the point of the priest, to help the, the people understand what was being read by Ezra. So, why do I bring this up in a discussion about Christmas? We should be able to explain to others uh, what we do and what we don't do in our worship services to God. Why do we have communion uh, every Sunday and only on Sundays? Uh, why do we believe in, in baptism by immersion? Uh, uh, why don't we use instrumental music? Why don't we have a manger scene up on the hill here? Uh, why don't we have a Christmas pageant, or, um, or do we? So we're going to give a quick history of why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th. First of all, you probably know yesterday was the winter solstice. It's the so shortest day of the year. I don't know when exactly it started, but uh, 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 from what I've read, as man moved north, and they started to see that the leaves changed colors and uh, the, from green to brown and uh, uh, that the, the days got shorter. And finally, somebody figured out that uh, or somebody thought, you know what, the, the sun must be dying. So we need to do something about this. So let's have a celebration to uh, to get the sun to come to come back. And obviously, astronomy has been around for a long time. And so the so-called priests of these religions knew about astronomy. And so they had. For instance, there was one celebration they called Yule, where they would burn a log for three days, and miraculously, the days would start getting longer again. Of course, he knew it was going to happen anyway, but the, the, the masses didn't understand that that was going to happen. All right. So um, they also, there was a, a Greco-Roman festival called uh, Bruma, which means winter sol solstice. This normally happened on December 17th. Set 
Chinalia, another uh, holiday that was, uh, was, or festival that was celebrated uh, to Saturn, or if you know anything about Greek and Roman mythology, there's normally a one-on-one -on -one parallel between the, the Greek so-called gods and the Roman gods. The Greeks were first and then the, the Romans came later. So Saturn was actually the father of Jupiter, uh, or in the Greek version, Cronus was the father of Zeus. And this was uh, Saturn, the Roman god of agriculture, and his festival ran from December 17th, originally just one day, and they said, you know what, we're having too good a time here, and we're going to make it longer. And, and uh, in fact, with, uh, with uh, Bruma, this coincided with the ripening of the grape juice that had been put away after the harvest, and so now this grape juice has, has become fermented wine, and this was a good reason to party. So that's what they did. And so they decided to make the party longer, and it, that uh, ran through uh, the 17th to the 23rd or the, the 24th. Okay, Sol Invictus. Approximately 274 A.D., December 25th was set aside to celebrate Sol Invictus, which uh, means the unconquered sun, and this represented the birth of the sun, the birth of the solar sun, as well as the winter solstice. Now, we know the winter solstice is not December 25th, but they're, at this time they're using the Julian calendar. The Julian calendar was slightly off. Today we use the Gregorian calendar. All right, and actually the days were just a little bit shorter uh, than the Julian calendar suggested. And so from about 42 B.C. when the Julian calendar started through uh, 274 A.D., they gained about four days. So that's why this, the winter solstice... In, uh, that was, was celebrated on December 25th and not the, the 21st. All right. Approximately uh, 351 A.D., uh, Pope Julius I of the Roman Catholic Church initiated the Mass of Christ on December 25th. And that was, there used to be one celebration called Epiphany when the, when the, uh, the shepherds saw they had the Epiphany that, that a child had been born uh, approximately on January 6th, according to the, uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia anyway. Um, and so he, he, he wanted two separate uh, celebrations, one for the Mass of Christ and a separate one for Epiphany. And then a few years later, the Bishop Liberius makes December 25th the official birthday of Christ. All right, so now here's the question. Does it seem to you that the worship of the Son, S-U-N, was replaced by the worship of the Son, S-O-N? In my mind, without a doubt, yes, it was. You had pagan festivals that were, uh, had to do with the, the, the winter solstice, and these had been co incorporated to the birth of Christ. So we went from the birth of the Son, Sol Invictus, S-U-N, to the birth of the Son, Jesus the Christ, S-O-N. Now, uh, again, according to the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia, they would... It, it says there that uh, you will, just the opposite of what I'm saying, no, this isn't based on a, a, a pagan ritual. Actually, it's the other way around. We were doing the, the, uh, the celebrating Christ's birthday, and then the pagans copied that. I like that argument, just not in this case. I believe that uh, you may have heard historians talk about you know, how uh, Christians, uh, our theories, on, on the creation sound a lot like uh, those of, of other religions, other, other pagan groups, other, uh, other non-Christians. Well, in my mind, that's because somebody heard the original story from those people who left after the Garden of Eden and, that, and after uh, Noah and the people spread out. They heard those original stories, and they adapted those stories to their own civilizations, their own cultures. All right, so, again, uh, it seems just obvious from this situation that, that December 25th came, was just ended up working into uh, the so-called Christendom. All right, and one of the things I ask myself, when God wants us to know something, does he normally tell us? God doesn't tell us when Christ was born. And the, obviously it's important that he was born, but it's more important that he lived and as an adult made a conscious decision to die on the cross for you and I. That's the important thing. Okay, let's uh, move along here. Uh, Deut Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to summarize a little bit here. 
Again, Moses speaking to Israel in verse 1, he says, Now, O Israel, listen. Verse 2, and this is very important. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Skipping on to verse 5. Surely I have taught you, your, you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, this, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all this, these statutes and say, Surely th this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Isn't that what the, uh, the peoples of, of around us should be saying about the church, that these are wise and understanding people? Now, in, in my mind, the, and I, I don't know if this was on the slide or not, I was kind of on a roll there and, and forgot to look. <laughs> But I, I'm not used to this, sorry. In my mind, the church should be like uh, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court today looks at the Constitution, understands what the Constitution meant at the time it was written, and then they tell us how it applies to us today. As Christians, we should be able to go to Scripture, look at what it says there. In the case of these Old Testament Scriptures, we should be able to understand what it meant when Moses was speaking to the people of Israel. Then we should understand how this affected the first century church, and then we should understand how it affects us in 2013. That's what we're supposed to be, be able to do. That's why the Holy Spirit indwells us, because according to 1 Corinthians, the Holy Spirit gives us understanding. We have a tool that, that other people don't have. They may think they have it, but they don't really have it. We have the opportunity to, to uh, share the word as other people can't. We need to take advantage of that opportunity. Okay. So again, we want people to look at us and say, this is a wise and understanding people. Staying in Deuteronomy, going to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 12, looking at verses 29 through 32. Again, Moses talking about when he, uh, God is going to cut off the, the heathen nations and, and the nation of Israel is going to displace them, dispossess them. I'm reading from the New King James Version here. In verse 30, take heed to yourselves that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship God, the Lord your God, in this way. For every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. Doesn't John say the same thing in the book of Revelation? You're not to add to God's word or take away from God's word. This is, if you've ever been to court and had to testify, uh, when you're asked to swear or affirm, I choose to affirm, but that's another story. Uh, you're asked to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The truth, don't lie. The whole truth, don't leave anything out. Nothing but the truth, don't add anything to it. That's what we're supposed to do with God's word. That's what Moses tells us. That's what John tells us in the book of the Revelation. It's the same thing. In my mind, when we add something and make it a holy day, we are, we've added to God's word. Now we're going to talk about holy days in just a minute. One example of uh, an unauthorized worship can be found in Samuel Chapter 15, verses 1 through 31. I'm not going to read all those verses, not to worry. What's going on here? Saul has been anointed king. Uh, Samuel, the prophet of God, is speaking to him. And uh, he tells them to, uh, he, uh, God, through Samuel, tells Saul to attack Amalek, uh, utterly destroy them. And, and I'm in verse 3 of uh, chapter 15. Kill both men and women, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep and donkey. All right. Uh, but what happens? They win the battle. But in verse 9, Saul and the people spared Agag, that was the king, and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings and all these other animals. And uh, says they were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. So Saul and the people decided to keep to keep the king alive and, and keep the, the best of the animals. Why do they do this? All right. In verse 10, the Lord speaks to Samuel. 
God is very unhappy with Saul. He says, I, I greatly regret that I have made Saul the king. Why? Because he disobeyed what I told him to do. In verse 13, uh, Saul sees Samuel coming and he says, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Samuel's like, wait a minute, if you kill everything, why do I hear cows mooing? And she, you know, why do I hear this, this noise in the background? So in verse 15, Saul says, they have brought them, they, the people, have brought them from the Amalekites, uh, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So now Saul is saying, no, it wasn't me. It was the people. And, they, and hey, they did this to honor you. Uh, they, well, they did this to honor God. That's what he's telling uh, Samuel. But Samuel says, be quiet. All right. And he says, why then, in verse 19, why then did you not obey the, the voice of the Lord? But Saul says in verse 20, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone on a mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly de uh, uh, destroyed the uh, Amalekites, or however you say that. In verse 21, but the people, now Saul is, no, nah, it wasn't me, Samuel, even though we read before it was Saul and the people. Now Saul say, no, nah, it wasn't me. It was the people. The people took this plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Okay. What does Samuel say in verse 22? Has the Lord as, uh, excuse me, has the Lord as great delight in birth offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better to sacrifice and the heat is than the fat of rams. Skipping on to verse 24. Saul said to Sam, uh, Samuel, I have sinned. Why did he sin? Because I fear the people and obey their voice. Popular demand. All right, the pressure of the people uh, on Saul made him do something that was disobedient because he felt the pressure. All right. In verse 26, and, Saul, and Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. He, he wants, uh, Saul wants Samuel to honor him and come back with him. Why? Because you have rejected the word of the Lord and the law, Lord has re rejected you from being king over Israel. Because of this, Saul is going to, is going to lose his, his uh, position as king because he disobeyed God. In verse 28, Samuel says to Saul, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today. And in verse 30, Saul admits that he has sinned. But the sentence has already been handed out. He's going to, to lose the kingdom. He says, yet honor me before the elders and my people and before Israel and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Saul turned, his, uh, turned back after Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. Well, Saul learned his lesson for the point. We know that he's, he still loses the kingdom. He didn't learn the, the, the lesson completely because he, he did bad things after this. But the bottom line is God doesn't want anything extra. The Bible is full of stuff that God wants us to do. We don't need to add anything to it. This will keep us busy, I'm pretty sure. Um, I know that I could use some help doing everything that it says. And it's really simple. You know what, people, and what he's saying to Saul here, just do what you're told. That's it, just do what you're told. It's really just that simple. Okay, some other examples of uh, unauthorized worship. Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, they have been by you. Obviously, the, uh, the unholy fire before the Lord, you know that they were killed instantly, and their father Aaron wasn't even allowed to, uh, to mourn for him. And the, the uh, books of Kings and Chronicles are full of uh, the nation of Israel making mistakes and, and being punished for it. One uh, major mistake is uh, Jeroboam, when he created the golden calves and the false priest, uh, priests that weren't Levites, um, and, and these feast days, and, um, and set up a, an alternate place for the people to worship. Say, you know what, uh, this is the northern kingdom of Israel. He says, you know what, it's really too far to go to Jerusalem. You don't need to go all the way down there. You can worship right here. Don't, don't worry about it. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to make it, make it work. 
in 2 Kings 21, 1 through 18, and uh, 2 Chronicles 33, 1 through 20, we read the story of Manasseh. Manasseh was, uh, Manasseh was, the, uh, was the son of uh, Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. Right on his heels, Manasseh was a horrible king. And uh, just some of the bad things he did, he re rebuilt the high places, the altars to Baal and Asherah, the heathen gods, the Baals were the male gods, the Aster, Asterahs or Asterim or Asteroths were the female gods. Uh, they built altars to false gods right inside the temple. He beat, built these altars right inside the temple of God. Uh, and in the courtyard, he burned one of his own sons. He sacrificed one of his own sons to, this, uh, to one of these heathen gods. And Judah... This was the southern kingdom. Judah, Judah became worse than all of the heathen nations around them. That's how, how bad they were. And even after Manasseh repented, guess what the people still did? They still sacrificed on the high places, but they're saying, well, it's okay because we're sacrificing to the one God now. No, it's not okay. Uh, one of the many violations that they, that they committed uh, was the law in Numbers 33, 50 uh, through 22, uh, 50 through 52. Uh, and the Lord spoke to Moses in verse 51, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you have crossed over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out the inhabitants of the land, which we know they didn't do, and before you, uh, before you destroy all the engraved stones, destroy all the molten images, and demolish all of the high places. The nations uh, thought if they were up on a high place, they built their altar up on a high place that were closer to their gods. And the command from God to Israel was to destroy all of these high places, which we see uh, with uh, uh, Israel under, or Judah under Manasseh's rule, that his father Hezekiah had knocked down the high places. Manasseh rebuilt them, built these false, uh, uh, these altars uh, on the high places. And even after he repented, the people still wanted to use those high places to worship the true God. You're not supposed to do that. They weren't supposed to do that. Okay. New Testament. That Old Testament stuff, you know, how does that affect us? Well, it does. We'll get to that in a minute. In a few minutes. In a, in a, in a very few minutes. All right. New Testament about special days. Obviously, uh, let's just jump right into uh, Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, 1 through 6. This is talked about a lot because it starts out, receive one who's weak in the faith. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. The, these, these people that were weak in the faith uh, didn't want to eat certain foods. Now, some have suggested that this was the food that had been sacrificed to idols. Paul speaks to that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It doesn't say that here, so that could be one of the problems. One of the problems could also be, in, in my, my mind, uh, is the problem is, is that now that the church is not only jo those who were Jews by birth and, and proselytes, those who converted to Judaism, it also included Gentiles. Gentiles didn't have the dietary restrictions that the Jews had. Gentiles could eat whatever they want whenever they wanted it. And so uh, think about the, the, Peter dream, uh, the dream Peter had before he went to see Cornelius when all the, the, the food in the world came down on a big blanket and God said, eat. And Peter says, I've never eaten anything that's unclean. It took three times before Peter got it. That when God said, what, don't you dare call unclean what I've cleaned. So not only that, is, that represented all the nations that the Jews had considered unclean. Now God is saying they're going to be clean. Therefore, Peter will go preach to Cornelius. But that also included all the foods that they ate. All these foods are clean now. So the point that I want to get to is in verse 5. One person esteems one day above another, another every day alike. Each, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. You see the part in italics, or it wasn't italics, the, the next part about not preserving. That's not in the original text. It, you do find it in the King James and New King James. But it says, he who eats, eats to the Lord, uh, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, uh, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God in verse 22. Before God, happy is he who does not condemn him, uh, himself for, in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever 
It is not from faith is sin. That goes back to the be fully convinced in your own mind. About the food thing, if you're, if you're eating and you say, well, you know, I really don't know if I should eat this, and you eat it anyway, you sinned. But getting back to the, the days, you're saying, you might say, well, you know what? I'm taking this, this one day out of the year because I want to honor, honor God, just like Paul says to the Romans here in, in uh, chapter 14. Well, when you look at the context, what I believe is going on here is that these days that they esteem above another, these were the ceremonial feast days that the, the nation of Israel had been observing for 1,500 years. Now you have someone who's, their whole life they've been observing, let's say, the Passover. Their parents observed it. Their parents before them observed it. And now you're saying, well, wait a minute, I'm a Christian, but didn't God authorize this too? So just to be on the safe side, I'm going to observe the Passover. I'm, I am a Christian, but I'm still going to observe the Passover. Paul is saying that in this instance, that's okay because what they're doing was authorized by God at one time. At one time. There is no biblical example that I know of where the practices of the heathens, say for instance the Gentiles who converted, I cannot find one example where those people were allowed to bring their, uh, the things that they did in their worship to their gods to worship the God of heaven. I can't find one. If they did something, if they sacrificed chickens on Wednesdays or something like that, I don't find anywhere in scriptures where it says, no, it's okay for you to sacrifice a chicken on Wednesday. It's not there. There's probably a reason for that. All right. I'm going to come back to this. So in, in my mind, and uh, again, when you look at the context, I believe what he's talking about here, because these things are approved by God, they're honoring God. In order to honor God, you have to do what he tells you to do. That's what these people were doing. They were doing what they were told to do, but it was, like I said, that was going to pass away, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So they're called the weaker, the, they're called weak in the faith. Their faith to the law of Moses was very strong. Their faith to the law of liberty, the law of Christ, that what was a little weak because they wanted to hold on to those things. All right. Now, you say, but gee, Jack, that's kind of a strong word. They were weak. Listen to what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses uh, 19 through 23. I'm not going to read that. You're all familiar with it, I'm sure. When Paul talks about becoming all things to all men, and he's, uh, that includes a Jew to the Jews, a, a Gentile to the Gentiles. If I need to be weak, I'll be weak. And he says, why is that? Uh, and as to by all means save some. Paul wanted to save as many people as he could. He wanted them to convert to Christianity. And that includes... That included Paul keeping track of special days also. How do we know that? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, at the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul tells the Corinthians that he's going to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. The only way Paul would know when Pentecost was, was if he knew when Passover was. And if he knew when Passover was, then he would know that after Passover, the, the first the, the day after the weekly Sabbath, you have a weekly Sabbath every Saturday, what we call Saturday. The day after that, the, the first day of the week, the day we call Sunday, was when the wave offering was. The wave offering was the first fruits. That was always a Sunday. Jesus is called the, the first fruits of the dead. All right, that was always the, the day we call Sunday. That was always the first day of the work, uh, of the week. Seven weeks later was Pentecost. Pentecost was always the first day of the week, the day we call Sunday. The only way Paul would know that and 1 Corinthians was written in AD 55 or 60, somewhere in there, 20 plus years after the, the death of Christ, the, after the church being established, for 20 years he kept track of Passover and these other days. That's the only way he would know when Pentecost was. That's the only way. All right. Is Paul weak in the faith? I don't think so. All right. But these things were allowed to continue for a short time as the Israelites were allowed to make the transition from Judaism to Christianity. This probably ended in A.D. 70. I don't see any place in Scripture where it says that definitively, but seeing as how that's when the temple was destroyed, that's probably, that would make sense when it happened. Jews right now aren't, uh, if, if you were born Jewish and you're a Christian, you're not supposed to celebrate Passover. That was nailed to the cross, which you see in uh, second, uh, not second Colossians, in Colossians chapter 2, verses uh, 11 through 17. Uh, I'm going to skip right to, to uh, four, uh, 
to verse 14. In, the, in those epistles, uh, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, um, what has been going on here is that you have, in, in my version of the Bible, called the circumcision party. Those, these were people that were, uh, again, Jewish by birth, who had converted to Christianity, and they wanted, not only did they want to keep these special days and these customs of, of the law of Moses, for instance, circumcision. They wanted the Gentiles also to keep these traditions. You know what? You're really a second-class Christian if you're not circumcised, if you don't keep these uh, feast days and all this kind of stuff. Paul is saying, no, you're not second-class citizens. And why is that? He says uh, in verse 14, let me start at verse 13. And you, speaking to those in, in uh, Colossae, uh, being dead in your trans, uh, trespasses and the uncircumcision of of your flesh, he, Christ, uh, has made a lie together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having, wipe, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements, having wiped, wiped out the old law that was against you, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The law of Moses was nailed to the cross. We are no longer under those, uh, those restrictions those requirements. Again, speaking to the Gentiles, uh, Gentile, uh, Colossians. Uh, skipping down to verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Obviously, the, they used the lunar calendar and th those things were very important. Why is that? Which are a shadow of the things that come, but the substance is of Christ. Do you really want to understand Jesus and the way his mind works? You've got to understand the Old Testament. Look at your Bible. Two-thirds of it is Old Testament. There's probably a reason for that, huh? Jesus will say one sentence in the New Testament, and there might be four or five chapters about that one thing in the Old Testament. You really have to understand it. That's what Paul is saying here. At the time, all they had written was, a, was the Old Testament. And he's saying that is a shadow. You look up that word, it also means a pattern. The Old Testament church the ecclesia, the called out, the nation of Israel, is the pattern for the church today. If you want to understand why we're, we do what we do, you need to understand the Old Testament. Why we take the, the Lord's Supper every Sunday? The priests were commanded to eat the, 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 the showbread every week. In their case, on the Sabbath, on Saturday, every week. We're commanded to do it when we come together every week. Every week. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay. So, what are you saying, Jack? I said a lot so far. I think, anyway. My, my head is spinning here. I'm going to read one verse that's not, not in your thing here. In Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. Peter is saying that he, that's the us, he, the other apostles and the other uh, uh, writers of, of the Bible were given everything that pertains to life and godliness so that we, that's the you in here, so that we can escape the corruption of the world. So, simple question. If God wants us to celebrate these special days, why don't we find it anywhere in Scripture? Why is it not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament? Could it possibly be, be because he doesn't want us to do that? That would seem reasonable to me. If the scriptures contain everything that pertains to life and godliness, and it doesn't say anything about celebrating the Mass of Christ, it doesn't say anything about using instrumental music, it doesn't say anything about a lot of things, but we do it anyway, then why do we do that? Why, why would we want to do that if the scriptures don't contain it? Again, the Bible is full of God's commandments. In, in, in the book of John, Jesus says over and over and over again, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says, you know, uh, the verse we hear all the time, greater love has no man to lay down his life for his friend. 
What does the next verse say? You are my friend if you keep my commandments. It all comes back to the, the keeping my commandments part. Very quickly, uh, I'm going to skip some of this because uh, this I've been throwing a lot of information at you. But the bottom line is getting down to the Christmas celebration. There's the Mass of Christ, which in my mind, there's no doubt about it, we are not to be involved in. We are not supposed to look at this as the birth of Christ because actually Christ wasn't born on December 25th. He just wasn't. The historians will tell you that it's probably in the fall sometimes, but guess what? God didn't tell us. So uh, probably he didn't want it, it, it wasn't that important. Again, it's the fact that he was born, he lived a perfect life, which made him the perfect sacrifice to, so his blood could wash away our sins. Uh, so is it okay for us to celebrate Christmas as opposed to the Mass of, of Christ? I don't see anywhere in Scripture that outlaws festivals. This is a wonderful time of year. You know what? I like Santa Claus, even though the, our, the current version of Santa Claus is based on a 1930 Coca-Cola ad, the red and white. You notice that's the colors of Coke? It really is. I didn't make that up. <laughs> uh, St. Nicholas, the Roman Catholic Church, now says, you know what? We thought he was at the Council of Nicaea, but now we don't think he was. And in 1970, they said he's not a saint anymore. So uh, in my mind, I can separate... Uh, the overweight dude that eats a lot of cookies and, and has a magical sleigh and comes down a chimney, even if you don't have a chimney, I can separate that from the baby in the manger. Uh, do all the, the things that we use to celebrate Christmas, the holiday, as opposed to the Mass of Christ, the holy day, do all of those have their, their uh, origin in pagan religions? Yes, they do, believe it or not. The Druids thought the Christmas trees were special because they were green all year round. So they would put candles on them, then they'd burn the tree. The wreath was uh, the, the cycle of the sun. Uh, they thought mistletoe was magical. Uh, it grew on oak trees. They couldn't see any roots. They thought that lightning struck the tree and then mistletoe would spring out. And it was a great aphrodisiac. Does anybody believe that? No. All of those things uh, over the years have lost their meaning. Now they're used in a Christmas festival. Um, and some, I, I read things where hardliners say, well, you shouldn't do anything that represents paper, pagan gods, so on and so forth. One person even said that when you put your child on Santa's knee, you're reenacting uh, the, the pagans that used to worship a god that had a big belly. They'd heat up the god and they'd open up the doors and they would throw their kids in. And, and when you put your kid on Santa's knee, that's, you come on, man. <laughs> I'm, to me, that's kind of stretching it. Okay? So, and, and plus these, th these things, uh, these, the trees and, and so on and so forth, as far as I know, haven't tried to be incorporated into Christianity. I did see one reference towards Holly, the leaves supposedly represent the, 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 the uh, crown of thorns and the, the red berries represent Christ's blood. But again, that's, that's a stretch. These things weren't tried to, they, they weren't worked into Christianity uh, and made holy like the uh, winter solstice to me obviously was. That's just obvious that it was. So I can separate those things. In my mind, Santa is like the Tooth Fairy, the Sandman, the Easter Bunny, which, uh, again, I can separate uh, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of, of Jesus with the Easter Bunny with a basket with hard-boiled eggs and, and stuff like that. You know what I mean? We, we just celebrated the death, burial, and resurrection uh, of Christ and his ascension into heaven and his coronation as our king. We don't need a... Uh, the, the, the devil wants you to have these special days. You know, the devil loves the fact that people are religious. He loves the fact that, that we are wired to worship someone or something. And he wants you to believe that you could go out and fast Tuesday, on Fat Tuesday and get drunk as a skunk, do whatever you want, and the next day you get a little smudge on your forehead and it's all good. He wants you to believe that. He wants you to believe that you don't need to come to service every week. Just on these special, these really holy days, that's when you should show up. That's what he wants you to believe because he uses these things as a distraction. He takes something good and then it starts out here and it, just, for those of you that shoot, you know what I mean? You, you're a little bit off the mark. You start out here next you know, and next you know you're way over here. That's what the devil wants you to do. That's how he operates. I like the holidays. I, like, I even like fruitcake. That's how I, that's how, well, if it's more cake than fruit, let me specify there. So this is a, a, a happy time of year. So I can separate those things. If you can't, then 
don't get involved. You, you, you should leave that alone. Uh, you, you should leave it alone. Whew. I'm tired. I'm going to wind this up right here. Whose birthday is Jesus concerned about? He's yours. It's yours. And actually, he's more interested in your rebirth. That's what Jesus cares about. He wants you to be born again. Uh, uh, an adult making a conscious decision to put the old jack in the ground and have the new jack come up. That's what Jesus cares about. That's the birthday he wants to celebrate. He also wants you to understand that if you were born again and you kind of slipped and you got into some stuff you shouldn't get into, guess what? The blood is going to cleanse you. It can, it, you can be washed again. You're being washed continually. You have that opportunity right now as we stand and sing. Thank you. Why from the sun?